This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Long Table number 185 on this, the last day of May in 2024. It is my pleasure today to introduce to you uh, Dr. Nathan Elkins, my colleague here at the American Numismatic Society, who is our deputy director. And as many of you know, Nathan is very well versed and very well published in the field of Roman coinage, and particularly um, the representation of architecture on Roman coinage, as well as various uh, images and iconography related to that. And in fact, today's talk, which is the third and last in a series on Nerva and coinage, um, uh, looking at Nerva in the Roman Empire, I'm sure Nathan will be drawing on one of his many uh, uh, publications. This is a monograph uh, that was published a few years ago that looks at Nerva and uh, the image of power uh, or the image of political power in the reign of Nerva, which is actually the title of this book. This was published by Oxford in 2017. And so with that, I'm more than happy to turn it over now to Dr. Elkins. Uh, so as Peter said, this is the third in a three-part series on the imperial coinage of Nerva, which is largely based on the book. Uh, the other two have been uh, recorded previously, so if you missed them, you can go back and see what you missed. Um, and so this is, as I said, the third installment where we're going to be looking primarily at the um, the the less defined messages on nervous coinage so in the first session we talked about uh, military types uh, that portrayed nerva as the supreme military commander uh, in the second installment we looked at types that targeted either the urban plebs in rome uh, or the senate or um, the italian cities and were, were much rarer by comparison and as you might remember if you were there for that these types also circulated more in the city of Rome and Italy than uh, they did outside of Rome and Italy, uh, much less frequent in the provinces. Um, but the types we'll be talking about today are generally found pretty much all over the empire and are generally the more common types that Nerva struck as well, uh, which I think makes them very important uh, communicators if we think about them from that perspective. So. Um, the project rationale, I know if you've been here before, you've seen these slides before, I'll go through them quickly, but just uh, for any newcomers, um, I often get asked, why would you study Nerva? Because nobody does. Well, that's a good reason to study Nerva. Um, he was ruled for 16 months after the death of Domitian and before the reign of Trajan. He adopted Trajan as his heir since he had no, no uh, heirs. Um, and when I was working back in Frankfurt uh, in the late 2000s, um, this was a center uh, for the study of archaeologically recovered coin finds. And one of the people working there at the time was Flair Kemmers, who had just finished her dissertation on the coin finds from Nijmegen. And she, along with some others, were pioneers in this concept of audience targeting, this realization that the Roman bronze coinage in particular um, had de very defined and distinctive circulation patterns. We're often told that the Roman imperial coinage circulated all over the empire. And while that might be true with certain types, the bronze coinage always had a very localized circulation pattern. And even in the imperial coinage, you can find, uh, like we talked about last time, types that really did not circulate outside of Italy or outside of other regions. So since a lot of that previous research had focused on the Flavian period and the Trajanic period, I wanted to write a book studying uh, the circulation patterns and audiences and messages of an emperor uh, from this perspective. Uh, and Nerva was a good choice because he lay between the Flavians and Trajans, so there should be evidence of this. And also he only ruled 16 months, which made it a pretty manageable data set of material to deal with. And of course, he was a good subject to study because, as I said, he hadn't been the subject of a whole lot of scholarly interest in and of himself. Um, 
And when he had been studied, people instead focused on things like the uh, succession crisis. Um, so this book, uh, it focused on um, the image and ideology projected on Nerva's coinage um, as a source material for his reign and the messages and ideas that were circulating among the people. And uh, one of the things it also did, which we will talk more about today, is think about the agency behind the selection of types, which I think is very important because in the study of Roman art more broadly, scholars have come to understand that um, it's not the kind of propaganda, quote unquote, that it's often been characterized in the earlier part of the 20th century, uh, you know, where it emanates from the mind of the emperor, uh, but instead might be uh, initiated outside of the emperor, either by a courtier or a high ranking Senate or from the Mint or something like that, and that the imagery um, has as one of its audiences the emperor. So in numismatic studies, you'll often read the emperor put this on his coin or wanted this message on his coin. It's actually much more nuanced than that, I think, and, and Nerva's coinage really points to this in some ways, I think. So it builds on the work of Barbara Levick, among others, who talked about this idea of um, type selection um, happening outside the person of the emperor um, with only um, some interventions with him. And of course, uh, since this was all oriented around coin finds to get the frequencies and audiences, um, here's the list of sources of the different inventories, which in tailed months and months of just going through lists from these different countries and creating a database and spreadsheets uh, to make charts. Uh, and just again briefly, um, uh, Nerva was a uh, Roman emperor from September 96 to January 98, immediately after the death of Domitian. Uh, he had been a close friend and advisor to the Flavian emperors. Uh, and this might have been one of the reasons he was chosen, uh, because he was acceptable not only to the Senate, who hated Domitian, but also to the military, who, at least initially, uh, who very much loved Domitian, since he was a kind of a Flavian loyalist in that regard. Um, he also had no children, which means he had to adopt, and of course, as we know, Trajan was who he adopted. So these are the primary types I'll be talking to you about today. We'll talk about Fortuna, we'll talk about Libertas, and then of course Equitas and Justitia. These are the personifications that appear on his coins. Um, but before we start talking about these personifications, uh, I want to highlight how common some of these are. So this is the large um, horde of Cistercii, the Garonne horde from France. Um, which had 145 sestertia of Nerva in it, and when you look at the frequencies, you see about a third of these are Fortuna, and a third of these are Libertas, and then various other types making up the rest. Um, Libertas and Fortuna are your most common types, um, and then if we move forward, you'll see this pattern is generally the same in other fine complexes and other denominate other bronze denominations as well. So the top we have Rome, Cistercii, Dupondi, and Azes, and you can see Libertas making up between a third and half, uh, although some of these are very small samples. Uh, and then at the bottom, the Mainz Taunus Vetterau area in Germany, which is a well excavated and well recorded area as far as coin finds go. You can see again Libertas and Fortuna making very large proportions of these. <clears throat> One of the images that uh, I want to talk about that is not a personification of I an ideal per se, but does communicate a broad generic message is the priestly emblems, which you see uh, here on the coinage. Uh, the coin on the left is the one of Nerva. Uh, it has uh, um, uh, various priestly implements. Uh, and then you see a prototype on the right, um, which draws actually from a coin of Julius Caesar. The one on the right is the coin of Julius Caesar. And what these referred to was um, 
sees her holding um, being an augur, which is a type of priest, and also the being the Pontifex Maximus, uh, the highest priest in the city of Rome. Um, so these were struck after Nerva's first issue of coins in his second issue of coins. And these probably again refer to uh, these religious positions he held uh, and also communicated more generally his religious piety, which was uh, important for any emperor. They only appeared on these silver coins. Um, and I actually have one of these here to show you. Yeah, so this is the coin of Nerva. Uh, with the priestly emblems. Uh, I realized as I was carrying the coins over that I actually forgot to pull the one of Julius Caesar, so I don't have it here for you, but we do have the one at the ANS of Julius Caesar. Um, and also, if you do have the book, um, I want to note that um, one thing that was pointed out to me after I published it, a very welcome correction from Bernhard Wojtek, is in the book I compared it with slightly different representations by earlier emperors that referred to the pr four priesthoods. You know, it was, it was Wojtek who pointed out that this actually draws uh, more closely from the coin of Caesar. Uh, so it doesn't affect the overall interpretation a whole lot, but it does different prototypes. Uh, so I wanna thank Bernhard for that correction. Uh, as I said, the most common image uh, that appears on Nerva's coinage is Fortuna. And you have Fortuna on all of the denominations, the gold ori, the silver denarii, uh, and then the sesterci, depondi, and azes. And so it's also important that she appears on every denomination, I think. She really is the most prevalent and common, uh, most common image on Nerva's coinage, according to Fines. Um, and I think it's important for us to ask why that is. Well, and maybe we can also take a step back and think about um, personifications on Roman coinage, which they become much more pre prevalent in the later first century and into the second and third century AD. Uh, and if you read a lot of older numismatic literature, um, they're often described as unimportant or repetitive or uninteresting. And I actually believe quite the opposite, which is the reason they're increasingly common is because they are important communicators. If you have a distribution of money that appears on the coins, like on the Sesterci, some of the Sesterci we talked about in the last installment, the only people that has relevance to is a select group in the city of Rome that actually benefited from that distribution of money. If you have fortuna on a coin, which means good luck, good fortune, right? The good fortune provided by the emperor who is reigning, you see in that what you want to see depending on what your relationship with the emperor is. So if you're a senator, you see an image of fortune on the coin of Nerva, that means to you you don't have to fear for your life like you did under Domitian, who was uh, having se uh, several different senators executed uh, and their lands confiscated and so on and so forth. Um, if you're one of these people who gets a distribution of cash in the city of Rome, you see your financial benefit in this. Um, if you're a newly appointed military commander, you see that as your good fortune. So. Um, you know, this kind of vague messaging actually is more successful because it allows the viewer to read into it what they want to. And uh, I should also acknowledge that over the last um, couple of decades, there's been a lot more interest in recognition of the importance of personifications of imperial ideals uh, like Fortuna and others. Uh, on the Roman coinage. And of course, there's a really great book by Carlos Nureña called The Personification of Imperial Ideals or something to that effect that was published, uh, I think, by Cambridge in 2011. Um, before we move on, I have some Fortuna coins I will show you. There is a Denarius of Nerva, and you can see Fortuna Augusti clearly labeled the good fortune of the emperor or brought by the emperor uh, and then you see the personification 
holding the cornucopia, symbolizing abundance or prosperity, and then also holding a rudder, which suggests good guidance or good administration, um, as if the administration or the empire were a ship that were being steered by the emperor. And uh, here is also an as, uh, I believe this is an as, yes, of Nerva. Uh, so you can see it again here on a different denomination. And uh, there, of course, is Nerva's handsome mug on the obverse. Uh, to move on, I want to talk about two personifications in tandem. Those are Equitas, who is the personification of fairness or equity, um, and Eustitia, who is the personification of justice. Equitas is a very important personification on Nerva's coinage. She is the third most common image on his bronze coinage, uh, or appearing on the Azes. Um, and Eustitia is a rarer type, but importantly, and I think this is worth highlighting, she only appears at the same time that Equitas appears. So she never appears alone. They always appear in the uh, same emission. Um, one of the things you might be aware of if you're really into the imperial coinage and read a lot about it is there has been this idea developed uh, among scholars of Roman imperial coinage that Equitas is a substitute for moneta, the personification of the Roman imperial mint um, after the reign of Domitian, I believe it is, or sorry, maybe it's a response to Galba. I'm trying to remember offhand. I didn't take notes on this in advance. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, this, because they look the same, they both carry scales and they both carry the, um, the cornucopia. So you can see the cornucopia and the scales, which are the same attributes of moneta. Uh, they're labeled dif differently, of course. This one says equitas instead of moneta. And so this is an idea that has been developed <clears throat> and um, scholars have a tendency to view equitas as a substitute for moneta so that equitas means um, good fiscal administration or refers to the fineness of the imperial coinage that you can trust it. Uh, I take issue with this kind of overarching interpretation that's been applied universally to the Roman imperial coinage. And I think if you look in specific cases like Nerva's, you see that um, what it's actually doing, like all of the other personifications on the coinage, is reflecting contemporary poetry and panegyric that has the emperor as an audience. So all we have to do is to turn to the primary sources. Marshall, in his 11th book, which is written in um, the first year of Nerva's reign in praise of the emperor, it's dedicated to the emperor, the poems address the emperor Nerva, uh, he praises Nerva's equitas, his sense of fairness, uh, flatters him for it. Pliny, who is also a contemporary of Nerva and who writes the Pranegyric of Trajan uh, after Nerva dies and becomes consul and, and after Pliny becomes consul in 100, he um, talks a lot about the emperor Nerva, the deified Nerva, and talks about his own uh, fairness, his equitas. So I think this refers to the ideal of, that, of, of fairness, not the guarantee of good coinage or good fiscal administration. Um, and this is a subject I wrote about not only in the book, but in this article cited below in the uh, Numismatic Chronicle. Uh, Equitas and Eustitia are paired together here on this slide because they are very closely related concepts in Roman literature. Uh, Equitas is described as the other side of Eustitia, um, and uh, Nerva is also praised uh, for um, Eustitia by Frontinus, another prominent senator during Nerva's reign, <clears throat> and um, Pliny, of course, tells us that unlike uh, Nerva, uh, Domitian lacked Eustitia, this sense of justice. And so justice in the Roman mind is close adherence to the law, especially in a judicial context. Equitas is a little bit more gen generic in the sense of overall fairness, although it also has kind of a, a legal connotation to it. 
And on this same subject, um, just to try to even dismiss this or counter this, what I believe to be this overinterpretation of Equitas as a substitute for Moneta. Um, and it's interesting, I, I can't tell that this image has ever been leveraged in this way before, but we do have at least one representation that I know of, of Equitas outside of the coinage, which is here on a section of a, the marble frieze from the Forum of Nerva, which depicts Equitas in the context of the judgment of Arachne, and you can see her here holding these scales. So here we have Equitas not as uh, a guarantee of quality coinage or standing in for moneta, but again in this in this sense of fairness uh, in a kind of legal context. So I think that's powerful evidence as well because it's near contemporary with the coin. Of course, these rele reliefs were cut late in the reign of Domitian, and then the forum uh, was rededicated to Nerva. Here is a denarius with Equitas, and you can see her labeled Equitas Augusti, and she's got the cornucopia, and then the scales, the balance of fairness. Uh, there's your portrait of Nerva on the obverse. Uh, and we also have Equitas on an as. Uh, here you see her again with the same attributes, uh, the uh, scales, and then labeled Equitas Augusti. And then here is your uh, representation of Justitia seated here um, with Justitia Augusti clearly labeled. And again, these only appear in the same emissions. You also see Equitas, and there is Nervous Portrait. Now, <clears throat> if you've been around for previous long tables, I've probably beaten you over the head with Libertas a little bit. This is kind of one of my pet projects. One of these days, uh, when I can do a little less administrating, maybe I can uh, uh, work more on my research, which is I have, I'm planning to do this book on Libertas. And the way I first got interested in Roman liberty uh, was studying the coinage of Nerva, in fact, back when I was writing this book and started thinking about uh, Libertas uh, and what exactly she meant and in what context she appears on imperial coinage. Um, in the first century, you often get liber Libertas, or always get Libertas, actually, when somebody who is deemed a tyrant uh, dies and a new emperor comes to power. So after Caligula is killed, for example, um, the coinage of Claudius features Libertas. Uh, after Nero dies, uh, the coinage of Galba and Vitellius and Vespasian feature Libertas. After Domitian dies, the coinage of Nerva features Libertas. Libertas is, of course, the personification of what we would call liberty or freedom. And in the Roman mind, Libertas is the, um, the opposite of slavery. So what this suggests is that under the tyranny of Domitian, the people were slaves. And so Nerva, as emperor, uh, is being portrayed as a more constitutional ruler under which the people are liberated, under which the Senate is liberated. And this is also communicated by the legend here, which is not Libertas Augusti, you'll notice, but Libertas Publica, the, the public liberty here. Uh, and importantly, she holds the Vindicta, which is this rod here, uh, which... Um, uh, was used in manumission ceremonies. Uh, I believe the shoulder of a slave was touched during the ceremony to free him. And uh, then there is this cap, the Peleus, which was ceremonially, ceremonially presented uh, to a freed slave upon his manumission, and that marked his freedman status. This was a very important message on nervous coinage in the aftermath of Domitian, because it is the second most um, common image on nervous coinage according to fines and hoards, and it appeared on all denominations um, uh, from um, Ori, Denari, Sesterci, Depondi, and Azes. Um, 
And again, if you look at the contemporary rhetoric, uh, the literature, um, the inscriptions and so on, uh, you'll see that uh, liberty was very, the idea of liberty was very prominent in the days and months after Domitian's assassination. So we have this inscription at the top here that was dedicated uh, by the Senate and Roman people, the SPQR, uh, on the accession date of Nerva's reign um, to the liberty um, provided by Nerva. Um, so the Senate sets up this inscription, which is probably a statue base. And then, of course, we have this famous passage from Tacitus uh, in the Agricola where he says um, that uh, the Emperor Nerva uh, first mingled two things that were in previously incompatible, and that is the principate, the rule of the emperors, and liberty. Um, and then, of course, Marshall in his 11th book, which, as I mentioned before, was written in the reign of Nerva, uh, also um, is constantly har harping on this idea of license and liberty. Um, he says, for example, uh, and of course, it's in the context of the Saturnalia, which is also separate, celebrating license and liberty, but uh, it's also harping on this idea of tyranny um, of Domitian that Nerva has freed the people from. So, for example, one of the things he uh, says is that license um, flourishes under Nerva. He says that the Elysian fields were to be emptied, uh, certain people uh, from Rome's Republican past uh, would come and praise Nerva, um, you know, all of these loyal Republicans, the anti Caesarian faction, and so on. Uh, Camillus, for example, the champion of liberty, would worship Nerva. Um, and then he also addresses in this 11th book, uh, Peleus wearing Rome. This is the freedman's cap that you see Libertas holding on the coins. Um, which, of course, refers to this custom of wearing the Peleus on the occasion of the Saturnalia, but also in the context of these preceding epigrams uh, that are addressed to the emperor, harped on this rhetoric of, of freedom uh, that was actively promoted um, uh, in, the, in, in literature and in spoken rhetoric, we must assume, and also on the coinage. So you have a nice confluence of media here celebrating liberty during Nerva's reign, and very, again, prominent on the coinage. Uh, so you saw an aureus on the screen. Here is a denarius um, of Nerva, and again, you, you have Libertas Publica, the Peleus, and the Vindicta, which I think you can see clearly there. And there is your portrait of Nerva. And I'll also show you this really nice Cistercius. Uh, might have to zoom out for this one. It's a big coin. Uh, so you can see uh, there's Nerva's portrait, and then on the reverse, you've got Libertas Publica, and again the Peleus, and the Vindicta. Um, one of the things um, about liberty, which I think is really important, and again, if we keep in mind that what I mentioned before, that the reason that personifications are so common on the coinage in the later first, second, and third centuries is because they communicate broad messages. Uh, we can see that in Libertas as well. Um, obviously, she's a retort to, to Domitian, but also something more. So you see the history of Libertas here, as I mentioned before, following emperors who um, were deemed as tyrants. So this one where my mouse is hovering now, if you can see that, this is an as of Claudius depicting Libertas, so referring to freedom after the reign of Caligula. Um, here's a coin of Galba with Libertas, uh, referring to liberty after the reign of Nero, again cast as a tyrant. And then down here you have uh, Vespasian also referring to, Nerv uh, to, to, to Nero. And then, of course, again on the right, uh, Nerva referring uh, to Domitian. But I want to point out two other coins here. Uh, this is a quadrons of Caligula, which has in the center uh, the Peleus, which is this attribute of liberty, as we discussed previously. And this coin refers to the remissa ducentissima, which is the remission of a half percent tax on auction sales. 
in Italy. That's what this RCC refers to. Um, so there is this idea that connects, especially in the Roman Empire, uh, liberty with freedom from taxation, uh, freedom from financial duties, and so on. Um, and you see the same thing over here also on uh, this coin of Galba uh, that you can, if, if you can see my mouse. Uh, so you have Libertas Augusti here, but if you look in the field, you have RXL, which is the remissa quadragensuma, the remiss, remission of two and a half percent tax on customs duties on goods entering Gaul. So again, this idea of freedom from taxation or freedom from customs duties. So again, depending on who you are, I think you look at a image of Libertas in the Roman Empire and you might see something different in it than somebody else. If you're a senator, you're thinking, oh, thank God Domitian's not around anymore. It's Nerva, he's a good guy, I'm not gonna get killed. Uh, whereas, you know, if you're uh, a merchant in Gaul or Spain or something, you might see freedom from these uh, uh, customs duties uh, that Nerva implemented. Um, or, 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 or not these in particular, but various other taxes that Nerva remitted, and he did remit several taxes. Um, <clears throat> so here's a list of some of Nerva's taxes, tax initiatives. So one of the things we talked about last time is he ended the abuses of the Fiscus Judaicus, uh, which targeted senators in particular, uh, and that's referred to on this coin here uh, that we talked about last time. He reformed the inheritance tax. Uh, he transferred any disputes with the fiscus from procurators to judgments in praetors' courts, which actually was a, a reform that uh, um, favored the complainant. We don't have to get into the logistics of that today, but take my word for it. It was a good thing uh, if you were complaining with the fiscus uh, to have a praetor judging this instead of a procurator. Uh, he also remitted obligations for the imperial courier in Italy, which, and this is the coin we talked about last time. Uh, so that was also a financial burden uh, on the cities of Italy. And we know he also reduced tribute from the provinces and granted them some privileges. So again, I think if you're one of these people who benefited in some financial way from these uh, fiscal reforms, these tax reforms that Nerva implemented, you might look at an image of Libertas and see this kind of message in it. You know, it's very fluid um, imagery. And this is, again, why um, uh, personifications are so successful. <clears throat> so as we move towards the conclusion, um, and these are things I've probably alluded to a little bit um, through this three-part series, is um, what is the significance of imagery on Roman imperial coinage? Um, as I said at the introduction, uh, where we often, you know, kind of without thinking when describing or writing about Roman coins, say the emperor put this on his coin or the emperor wanted to communicate this or whatever, we, you know, without thinking, we kind of ascribe this agency to the Roman emperor as if the Roman emperor were sitting around in his bedroom deciding what images to put on his coins to convince the people of some idea or another. And, and this idea is problematic for a couple of reasons, I think. Uh, one is, is that the emperor was the head of state of 25% of the world's population at the time. Um, you know, it, it was it was a massive undertaking. He had a lot of responsibilities. Uh, I think, quite frankly, he had bigger fish to fry than, than to think about what images appeared on his money. Uh, secondly, um, coinage is a form of state art. And uh, for many decades now, scholars of Roman state art, whether that be um, imperial portraiture or relief sculpture or what have you, um, have studied this question of agency and where it comes from. And, you know, it doesn't seem to be this top down directly emanating from the mind of the emperor uh, or necessarily even a close advisor, but there are always these people who are, 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 are coming up with the images and the messages 
and the emperor is an audience. I mean, if we think about most of the public monuments that are de dedicated in the city of Rome today, like the triumphal arches or the column of Trajan or something like that, these are not built by the emperor, but they're honorific monuments. They are dedicated by the Senate and the Roman people to the emperor. Now, this doesn't mean that, of course, that the emperor wasn't involved in at all. Um, you know, if we look at the funerary honors for Germanicus, for example, which is recorded in an inscription, what we are told is that the Senate comes up with a, a design for the Arch of Germanicus, and they even talk about the details of the statue and the relief sculpture that will appear on it. So the Senate came up with this all on their own. And then a delegation from the Senate goes and talks to the emperor and his family to tell them about their plans to see if this is okay. So there is an opportunity for the em emperor to intervene, but it's actually originated outside of the emperor and the emperor and his family or an audience of this. So I think this is actually kind of more how the coinage works, where the um, Emperor is an audience, and yes, he might s s uh, reject some forms of flattery or have it adjusted or what have you. And we do have some evidence for that that I don't need to get into today in other reigns. Um, but I want to show you here an example that uh, Barbara Levick had talked about, uh, and also to some degree Andrew Wallace Hadrill, um, which communicates or kind of illustrates some of these ideas I'm trying to articulate for you now that we see on the coinage of Tiberius. Um, so uh, over here on the left, for example, we have this shield inscribed Clementia, um, the idea of, of mercy or clemency of Tiberius. Um, and this reflects contemporary sources that were referring to uh, or flattering Tiberius for his clemency. Uh, and in fact, an, an altar of clemency was actually dedicated by the Senate to Tiberius during his lifetime. Um, same thing, moderatio was a, a, a moderation, was a, an, a, a, um, an ideal or a quality ascribed to Tiberius, and we see that on the coinage as well. Uh, we have the Temple of Concord on the coinage of um, Tiberius. Uh, and even though he had completed this earlier, uh, he did no work on it in his reign, uh, dedications were also made to Concordia during Tiberius's lifetime, which might also be the reason she appears, uh, the temple appears on the coins. Um, Pietas appears on his coinage, which is a good quality for, for um, emperors to have, and Suetonius tells us that Pius was a surname that had been offered to Tiberius, before. Um, and then we also have uh, Justitia appearing on his coinage, which again is very prominent in the contemporary literature, uh, which has Tiberius as an audience. And so if we think about this a little bit, you know, I, I try to imagine how this would work. And, you know, this is, of course, a, a, a theory, uh, we can never prove it. But one of the things that regularly happened was the imperial convivium, which is the imperial dining party in the imperial palace. And the emperor would host these things. He would invite senators, prominent uh, members of the equestrian class would come. And one of the things you would do at the imperium is flatter your host, and in this context, the emperor. So people would stand up and recite poems or lines of praise to the emperor. And so this was a venue where you could test the laudatory rhetoric that is being expressed to the emperor. And you could see how the emperor reacts, whether he accepts this kind of praise or he rejects it or um, modifies it in some form or fashion. And thinking about this, uh, um, we think about who would have maybe came up with the designs on coinage. And again, this is speculative, but various scholars, including myself, have, have written about these uh, ideas. So we have various possibilities. Of course, I mentioned the kind of standard assumption that the emperor generated these ideas and messages on the coinage. Um, 
We also have the Trace Weary Monotalis, who are still around, but they're anonymous by the period of the empire. Um, we also have the Procurator Moneti, who is the head of the Mint. And then there is a Procurator Aratianibus, who is something equivalent of the Minister of Finance, who oversees the head of the Mint. And these are equestrians, prominent equestrians, uh, both the Procurator Moneti and the Procurator Aratianibus. And so these are people who might have attended the convivium and seen and heard the kind of rhetoric and then been in a position to put image to these kinds of ideas on the coinage. Um, so I give you an example here, and again, this is speculation, but I write about it in the book. Uh, the first known procurator of the mint is Lucius Vibius Lentulus, um, who uh, was in that position from 98 to 102 in the reign of Trajan. Previously, he had been a, a tribune of the 8th legion uh, under Trajan, uh, and it's probable that um, Trajan came to know him during this service, won his favor, became his friend, and so, of course, when Trajan becomes emperor, he moves him out of the army and puts him into these uh, posts uh, as a trusted uh, member of his court and somebody who would run the mint. After this, we know he was promoted by Trajan to uh, governor of Pannonia and Dalmatia and later became governor of Asia. And he came back to Rome at the end of his career and became the procurator Arationibus, which is kind of like I said, this treasury uh, minister or secretary. Um, so this is a kind of individual who is close to the emperor, who would have known the emperor's mind, who would have um, been uh, in the imperial service, and who would have attended these convivia, these dinner parties where people like Pliny would have attended, or uh, maybe some of these other poets and things, and would have heard the rhetoric and would have been able to give image to the kinds of ideas that were circulating uh, to praise the emperor. And uh, so I want us to think finally again as I conclude about why personifications were important messages. And so if we start here on the very left, you see this coin of Nerva that I talked about last time that refers to the uh, remission of burdens associated with the imperial courier in Italy. So previously, before Nerva, um, if, if an imperial courier was sent from Rome to the north to give a message to a general on the frontier, uh, they would stop at various Italian cities as they made their way north, and those cities would have to provide room and board and food and fresh horses um, to, to the imperial courier. Uh, so Nerva remitted this burden so that the emperor would pay for it directly uh, so as not to tax those people. Whereas, if you have a personification of Libertas on a coin, this, as I said, allows a viewer to bring what they want to see to the message. So this freedom from this financial burden could also be communicated by the personification of Libertas because it doesn't tell you exactly what the message is. It leaves it to the viewer to, un to find meaning in the image of itself. And on the right, you know, modern comparisons are always dangerous because it's, it's hard to map or it's, it's, it's impossible to compare the modern world with the ancient world 2000 years ago. Nonetheless, we always try. Um, so these are imperfect comparisons, but on the right you see these, um, I, th I think probably everybody recognizes the Hope poster from 2008 on the far right, uh, which was the campaign poster for Barack Obama when he was during um, the primary campaign against uh, Senator Hillary Clinton. And um, there was an artist by the name of Shepard Ferry who printed a number of these progress prints, which you see just to the left, they, the two prints look almost identical except for the artist logo here, which is not present over here, and also uh, the word progress versus hope. So he sold these to try to fund a gr grassroots uh, campaign in California to support the senator during the primary. Uh, and he actually, after that, went and approached uh, the Obama campaign 
and asked for to see if this could be part of their official campaign uh, poster or something. And they were actually very open to this. Uh, they said, yes, we like the image, we like the graphic, but progress is not really our message. Uh, why don't they like progress? Well, it's kind of a direct, um, it, it has a negative connotation. It refers to the previous administration in a negative kind of way. You know, uh, Obama is better than his predecessor. There is progress, right? That's, that's kind of the idea being communicated here. They said, we're more about hope and change. And if you can think back to about 2008, you remember those were kind of the, the slogans of the Obama campaign. So they changed the message from progress to hope here. Uh, and why was this such a successful message? Why did this image really catch on? Um, what does hope mean? Well, it, it's not necessarily a negative retort to the previous administration, but what it does, like the imperial personifications, is it allows the viewer to see into it what they want. Um, hope for immigration reform, hope for a better economy, hope for student loan reform, um, hope for universal health care, what have you. Depending on who you are and your, your interaction with the government and your needs and all, all the rest, you might read hope differently than someone else, whereas progress is a much more defined kind of thing. This example with the posters also suggests the kind of initiation from outside the person of the emperor, uh, if we're talking about the coins, uh, versus, um, you know, the kind of adjustment you can see taking place when it gets to an official level. And I think this is the way a lot of the imagery on the imperial coinage worked, where it's initiated outside, might see how the emperor responds to it in the setting like the convivium where you're reciting these poems and so on, and then it gets adjusted if need be. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much. That's what I've got for you today, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Nathan. That was um, excellent as always. Um, always learn a lot, certainly. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, Nathan. Yeah. Good day. Uh, good afternoon. No, when you were showing the the Obama. Uh, uh, posters I was thinking of, uh, we had the exact same phenomenon in 18, 1981 in, in France with François Mitterrand's election. Uh, since he was from the Socialist Party, um, a range of people feared like, uh, well, instability or, or even, you know, riots in the streets. Or, and so his, his motto was, uh, la force tranquille, which in English means the quiet strength and the, the ah. emphasis on quiet, which was a way to reassure the public and the electorate that there would not be any revolution and, you know, uh, yeah. the mob would not enter your home and, and size your, um, your belongings or anything. Um, right. Back to Rome, um, you, you said at some point that um, I'd, I'd like to have your maybe more more insight into this um saying that bronze coins or bronze types sometimes had limited circulation so uh, for for Rome, roman provincial obviously we have like 300 different means and these coins with exceptions tend to circulate in the vicinity of these means but talking right. about uh, imperial bronze uh, it's rome and lugdunum and at some point it's rome only so how would you explain regional circulation when it's a single mint in uh, in one half of the roman empire uh that's a good question um i don't uh i don't have the details of the answer uh but i know where you can go which is to the work of flair kemmers because she's written about this idea of supply because that was the question that automatically uh becomes raised when you identify these regionalized circulation patterns is how does it take place um and with Nijmegen, for example the legionary fortress uh what she noticed was um that the soldiers were being supplied with flavian coins 
uh, Flavian bronze coins that had images of peace and victory on them, so military kinds of imagery, whereas even nearby cities had much less quantities of that. So it seems to have come in that case through military pay. Um, and so there seems to be these consignments of coins that go out from the city of Rome to various destinations based on need. Uh, and I believe she, I can try to look it up if you remind me next week. Um, I, I'll look it up. I, I know she's got an article on this. I think it might be in the Coins and Context volume from 2009, but it might be elsewhere if it's not there. But yeah, I know she's written about this. Thank you, great question. Uh, I'm seeing something that was posted in the chat. Um, said, what was the title of the book about persona? Uh, it's, um, Imper uh, what was it? If you Google Norrenia, Carlos Norrenia Imperial Ideals, you'll find it. It was published, I think, by Cambridge in 2011. But Imperial Ideals is in the title. I think it's maybe personifications of imperial ideals or something like that. I can't remember offhand. Uh, somebody's putting it up on the screen. Yeah, it's imperial ideals in the Roman West. Representation, circulation, power by Carlos Noreña. Maybe you can put that link in the chat, guys. <laughs> 